tonight I shall receive the very best that God has for me. This Bible is God speaking to me. This Bible is God speaking to you. This Bible is God speaking to us. I love the Word of God. I receive the Word of God. I hear the Word of God. I do the Word of God. I thank God for 3,000 members in every service at Abundant Life. Amen. Go ahead. Be seated if you would please. Open your Bible this, uh, this evening for a few minutes to the book of James. How many of you like the book of James? The book of James this evening. Let's just uh, let's learn about a few things that are real key to forward motion in your life spiritually and naturally. Glory to God. It's so important. Have you ever had anybody say that you trust? Talk bad about you behind your back? <laughs> Have you ever been guilty of talking bad about somebody behind their back that you actually liked? <laughs> Have you ever told a lie? <laughs> so, uh, it's very important to understand that words are extremely spiritual. Not all words are divine, but the ability to speak is divine. God made man speak. That's why it very well could be, and someday I'll flesh this out for you in a, a service. If I say this and you disagree with me, well, that's okay. We'll wait till we get to heaven, and on the way up, God will probably whisper to you, He was right on that one, you know, or something like that. But the rapture of the church. But it's very possible. You know, when, when, when Adam began to listen to the voice other than the voice of the Lord, then the Bible says the earth was cursed because of it. And there was something that was growing in the earth, that was growing out of the earth that God had placed there, that, that He partook of. The fruit that He took of was the one He was not supposed to. And so when He did, uh, the Scripture says, He loosed uh, because of His sin by listening to the voice, the words of someone other than God's Word for his understanding and his spiritual walk and his obedience. When he listened to the wrong words, he, the Bible says, it loosed a curse on the earth. Now, God didn't curse Adam, but he cursed the ground over words or over the wrong words. That very well may be because when God created man, He told him to have dominion. He said, have authority. He said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and have dominion, have authority over the earth. Those are powerful words if you say them. But whatever uh, God brought before him, He called it, and it was, the Bible says. So, God had given Adam a very powerful, powerful thing. The reason Adam began to sweat and labor uh, uh, from that point on uh, to get his own substance from the ground is he created an issue that said all of that was going to grow if it was tilled. Until that time Adam would speak to it. God had made him to say something and the earth was not originally created for a plow. It was created for words. That's what was supposed to create that sustaining work uh, in, in, in the need in Adam and Eve's life. And of course, when he fouled up in his words, the ground was cursed, the fruit was from the ground, the ground was cursed, and now uh, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. His name is Jesus. God sent someone to help overcome and to reverse the curse that had put, put now it's important to get that. You say, well, I'm not sure I buy into that. Well, just think about it a little while. Because in the context, and when you do a little Hebrew word study, you'll find out that those particular words, uh, like be fruitful and multiply and subdue and, and have authority over, those words don't just mean create babies. Uh, those words don't just mean cut out a section of land and cultivate it, you know, with, with green beans and stuff. It meant to say to or to speak with authority or have dominion and authority over that. And so, when he did that, that was lost. 
when Adam fell. Now, Proverbs 18, 21, somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah. says that in the tongue there is the power of life and death. Are you listening to me? Uh, in more than one place in the Scripture we see how the tongue itself is very, very powerful. What you say, God really uh, pays attention to what you say. Listen, angels pay great attention to what you say. And may I, may I just add, they pay a lot of attention to what you fail to say sometimes. Angels are activated, the Bible says, they respond to the Word of God. Amen. Are you listening to me? They are, they are messengers and they are ministers to the redeemed, the Bible says. And uh, Proverbs says they are activated, they respond to the sound of God's Word. Well, if you say God's Word, or God says God's Word, hallelujah, they respond to His Word. Y'all okay? Are you sure? They are ministering spirits. And they're there for a reason. That's why there is so much written in the Bible uh, about uh, what we say, why we say it, how we say it. That's why it's so important when we teach and preach the Word of God. Look, it's, it's an extremely sacred thing to me that God would have called us and chosen uh, me to do that uh, here at this church. It is an extremely, extremely important thing, the most important, number one most important thing in my spiritual life without a doubt is endeavoring to be accurate as much as possible with the Word. The reason is quite plain. I'll stand before God one day and there is greater judgment on me for the way I teach and preach the Word of God. Y'all still doing okay? Because your words are important. Uh, you'll notice in James chapter 3, or y'all, did I say James 3 a minute ago? James chapter 3, my brethren, let me just begin this just for a few minutes. We won't be here long tonight, but we're going to learn. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The word masters, I'm reading King James, most of your translations other than that are going to have the word teacher. It's actually the word, it's the Greek word that gives the Hebrew word for rabbi. It means a teacher, but not just a teacher, but a teacher of, of revelation. It means like a, uh, a teacher that is a more experienced senior instructor in the Scripture. And that's what that word is. So the King James uses the word masters. So it means masters of the, uh, of the Bible, masters of doctrine, those who teach and try to reveal not what the Bible is saying, but what the Bible said. Or the other way around necessarily. Not what it said, but what it is saying. And uh, God obviously helps bring that forth. So, I, And I don't know it all, but what I do know, I'm going to uh, bring it forth and believe God that the Holy Ghost will say what He is saying. Because it is a living epistle. And if we present it correctly, the Spirit of God will activate with that. And, and, and I can say one thing right here, and God will apply that to your life uh, in a need that you have, and someone else over here in a need they have, and someone else in a need they have. You can have a hundred different uh, uh, scenarios in, in that particular meeting, and that one word, God, will break it off and make it sound exactly like it's supposed to do that person. You ever had people say things like, I have it all the time, like, it felt like you were speaking right to me. Did you know about anything that was in my, I was going through and stuff like that? I, I deliberately don't know those things. I try not to know them if possible. Uh, when you pastor a church and you've been in it for many years and have great congregation and stuff, well, it's, it's, un, you know, it's inevitable you're going to learn some things. But in teaching the Word of God, I never teach to a person or to an individual or to a circumstance. Never have in 32 years, never will. Uh, we teach the Word of God. And then let the Holy Ghost multiply the bread and the fish the way He wants to. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, and so the Scripture says, My brethren, be not many... Uh, Revealers of the truth of, God, of the gospel, teachers, uh, masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater judgment. King James uses the word condemnation. You'll notice in your footnotes, or else if you're using a new King James or something, it probably says judgment. For in many things we offend all. That means in a lot of things people disagree. Have you ever noticed that when the gospel is preached, somebody may disagree with that? 
And that's what the word offend all means. It doesn't mean uh, right here that, that we're just supposed to offend everybody. It says, as you teach and preach the gospel, the kingdom of God reality versus the kingdom of this world, the fallen world reality, they are at odds with one another. Amen. And so sometimes people just get offended. Look at two people and say, not me, I'm in church tonight. Come on. <laughs> For in many things we offend all. Now watch this, watch this. Now if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, one translation says, a mature grown up. One who has mastered the art of talking. And of communication and of relationship. Uh, you, you can disagree with somebody and still have an agreeable spirit. Right. Praise the Lord. Praise I mean the key to that, uh, that's one of the main keys to, to, to marriage. And uh, excuse me, to happy marriage. <laughs> to long marriage, to successful marriage. That's probably the number one key. Is not being offended by the fact, sir, that your wife is not a man. Amen. So she doesn't think exactly like a man. She doesn't act exactly like a man, I hope. If she does, we have another message in Romans for that. <laughs> and ma'am, he's not a devil because he disagrees with you. Right. I, I know this is a, it's a penalty, but he's a man. <laughs> and sometimes you disagree. Learn the art of communicating with sincerity. You can sincerely disagree and uh, Sir, she's not your slave. She's your boss. No, no, she's your wife. She's your wife. And um, she doesn't have to agree with everything you say about everything in life. My God, she loves you. She's married to you. She gave you babies and takes care of you and probably, you know, washes your dirty socks and stuff. And I mean, it's pretty obvious. That she wouldn't be in the house. This is 2018. She'd have to stay there if she doesn't want to, you know. Uh, she does love you. Quit, quit acting like she doesn't. Uh, it, it's kind of joyful to live in the house with somebody who probably 90% of the time you agree on things, but when you don't agree, say, hmm, really? That's interesting. I wonder why you see it that way. Well, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I never thought of it quite like that. Huh. Yeah, is there any iced tea in there? <laughs> I mean, if you'll learn some kind of art like that, you, you know, not everyone has to agree with you. Come on, shout amen. amen. And so it says, if we offend not in, in word, we are mature. And able, it says, the only way that you're able to do that is you're able to bridle your tongue. The only way you can do it, you can have a thought come in your head like, you know, I can't believe he's disagreeing with me, or she's disagreeing with me, or there we go again, or this is just the odd, whatever your thought is, but don't let that bad thought get in your tongue. Amen. You bridle your tongue. I said bridle your tongue. Amen. And learn not to let that bad thought get in your eyes. Right. Come on, cleanse your eyes. Yes. Are y'all doing okay? I can have Pastor Cindy teach this if y'all would like to, because she's taught me all of this. <laughs> Believe me. For if any man offend, offend not in word, he is a mature man, because he is able, or able also, to bridle the whole body. I'd like to tell you that if you can bridle your tongue, and the word literally means, the word bridle, it's only used two places in the Bible. And uh, w when you see that particular word, it just means to make a lead animal out of some. Let's say you have a whole pack over here. You've got a whole flock. You have a whole herd. But one of them, you want them to be the bell cow. So you put a halter or a bridle on that one. Uh, some way or another, you put a lead rope on it, and that's what it's saying. And that becomes the leader of the rest of them. Can I just say that your tongue is generally the leader to the rest of your life? Amen. The rest of your family, your children, your relationship, your business, your job, your success, your failure, definitely your relationship in Christ. It has to do with what you say. Now, Adam lost a whole lot over words. 
He listened to the wrong words, the Bible says. Uh, listen, you need to be careful who you listen to. And that's another thing. That's a whole different message I'll get on maybe at another time. But look, uh, the spirit of rebellion never wants anyone to teach them. We, we're, we're in a generation today that doesn't want anybody to tell me anything. I just find it on the internet if I want it. Well, first of all, if you find it on the internet, someone's telling you something. That's right. So, it's extremely important to have a teachable spirit Amen. at all times. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Because you only learn things two ways in life. You learn things through information that is taught to you, someone telling you something, or through an experience. If you say, no one can teach me anything, I'm going to do it myself, you've just relegated yourself to this real small column of people over here called failures and losers. Because the only way you're going to learn anything then is by failing or losing at something. Because you will not ex receive instruction. So don't ever get that kind of a spirit about you. But be careful who teaches you. Are you all doing okay? Be careful how you learn and who you listen to, the Bible says. But always receive uh, the engrafted Word of God. The Bible says receive it uh, gently, receive it joyfully, receive it humbly. The engrafted Word, the Word that just grafts into your whole makeup, your personality. It becomes a part of you. It's a part of your thought process, assimilation, uh, your rationale, ability. All of that happens as the Word of God gets in you. Receive it, the Bible says, uh, joyfully, and it will be able to save your soul. Which means that as you go about in life, as the Word of the Kingdom has begun to, uh, to integrate into your whole mental makeup as well as your spiritual man, it begins to form the process of thought that you have. And by doing that, when you're interjecting the Kingdom of God principle in you, it is amazing how the Bible says you bridle your whole life. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Is this okay? Yes. Man, y'all kind of quiet. I, I may have Brother LaShawn get up here and crank the organ up here or something. Are we learning? Yes. So the Scripture says, if any man uh, offend not in word, then he is a mature man and able to bridle his whole being, his entire body. Behold, then James, now remember James is the pastor of the church that he's writing to. Which is interesting because uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again, in the New Testament, when you see the, uh, the apostles who wrote, none of them were the sitting pastor in their office with their gift at the time they were writing to those people. So this is a book written by the current pastor to the church that he is pastoring. So it's almost like he's having a men's meeting or a, or a certain teaching thing because he goes on in the next chapter and the next chapter and he talks about everything from how you treat people to what you do with your money to how to pray to the elders to everything else. He's actually put in. So James is a powerful book, one that many people are really messed up on because they think it's all about justification by works. That's why Martin Luther tore it out of his Bible. He didn't like the book of James. He tore it out of his Bible. He called it the epistle of straw. He didn't believe it was real. He thought it conflicted too much with the book of Romans. He thought Romans was the grace book and James was a works book that James must have been trying to prove a point or something. And he was writing out of his own experience instead of writing out of the unction of the Holy Ghost. How many of you know Martin Luther was wrong? Yeah. Not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther. <laughs> The religious reformer from Germany. He was wrong when it comes to that. Somebody shout amen. amen. Y'all doing all right? Yeah. Behold, we put bits in the mouth of horses. I don't know a lot about horses, but I know a bit is just a little piece of steel, basically. We put bits in the mouths of horses that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, a rudder, whithersoever the governor listeth, wherever the captain uh, steers it. That's how you turn it. Even so the tongue 
Even so, the tongue. Even so, the tongue. You know these big cruise liners they, that come in here? I've never been on a cruise before. I'm not, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't. I just don't necessarily like to get cooped up with that many people that I don't get to take at least one offering from <laughs> over a 10-day period of time. I mean, that's like too many people to pass up. I'm joking. And so you can go look at those things. Those, those ships are massive, of course. They're huge. And the big military ships and all of these, these big aircraft carriers, they are absolutely massive. And uh, you can go through them. I mean, they have some of the U.S. Air, uh, aircraft carriers today that have a place in the hangar on the ship for over a hundred aircraft just on the ship. I mean, some of them have five acres of landing deck on the ships. They'll be like what we would call 20 to 25 stories high and almost that many stories under the water when they're full and fully loaded. They are massive. And these things are so big, by the time you, you, you go all the way up to them, they got one on display now down in, in Corpus Christi. If you get down there, you ought to go see it. And by the time you get up to the top and you see where the, the governor, you know, where the captain, uh, the commander of that ship, where he does, if you want to go see the, the, the wheel that turns it all, that makes the rudders move and all of that kind of stuff, you go and look at it and you're thinking, this thing is so huge. This thing must have a major steering wheel. You know how big it is? Oh, it'll be about this big around. This big around. And it's all tied now. You know, a lot of them are, have nuclear power to them and all. And they're all tied to such a way that when you just turn that thing a little bit, it causes the, the, the rudders and all the, the, the uh, everything that, that steers the, that boat from the back, that ship from the back, it causes it to move. And it's just a little thing. But when it does, that, that huge piece of, 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 of floating artillery that just weighs thousands and tens of thousands, maybe a million tons. I don't know. It's just so big. It's unbelievable how big they are. It just turns it around. Just, if he wants to turn it, he can just adjust it like that. And it just turns that thing. He adjusts it like that. It just turns it around. So is the tongue. Do you like horses? I don't know a lot about horses. I, I, I do know a little bit. I'm from Texas. I mean, I can't eat a whole one by myself or anything, but I mean, they're, they're I just want to know if y'all are listening. I mean, they're huge. And uh, we, were up at, um, we were up at the livestock show uh, here a couple of years ago, and they had the Clydesdales, those big draft horses, you know, the Clydesdales. They are massive. I mean, they're so big, you have to look up to pet their nose, really. They're just, they're just huge. And then they'll hook these things up in these harnesses, and they'll have, you know, like 10 or 8 or 10 of them. You know, just, just, it's just amazing how they can do it. And I'm like, how in the world can you get that massive animal to do what those other ones are going to do in step and doing everything you want them to do? Well, they do it with a little piece of steel in their mouth. They put a bit in their mouth. And when they pull on it right, that horse just does this. And not yank on it, just kind of just tap it. And you pull on it just a little bit. That old horse does this. And he's weighing 2,000 pounds. And he just pull on, he just, they do it like this, he just backs up. It's stunning. And God used this exact same illustration for you and me. Verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member, but it boasteth great things. It has amazing ability. Behold how great a matter a match burns down a forest fire. Behold how a little fire, a little fire kindleth. Just a, just a little match, just a spark can burn down thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. It just starts a fire and then the fire starts going and the fire starts going. That's what our words are like. Mm, yeah. right. You want to have a godly marriage, a joyful marriage, a happy marriage? Start that fire. Mm. 
You want to have a horrible marriage, defensive marriage, frustrated marriage, threatened marriage, always on edge marriage, start that fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You want to have a blessed marriage? Start blessing everything in your house. Starting with yourself. Start blessing your wife. Bless, bless your husband. Bless your kid. Not cuss them, bless them. Amen. They're not perfect. That's right. They're humans. But light the fire of love. Light the fire of joy. You're the spark that lights the fire of health and healing. Light the fire of success on the math score with, with the teenager at school. Absolutely, you can do that. You can do it. You're no different from anybody else. You're smart. You're as smart as anybody in that classroom. You just got to commit yourself and focus yourself to it. Son, you're going to pass that test. If you have to take it five times, you're going to pass it. But pass it, you're going to do. Because you can. Hallelujah. Because if you let things start beating you when you're young, that you can do, but they're not convenient for you to do, then you will be letting things beat you all of your life that don't appeal to you, that you have to engage in, you've got to be involved in. And when you get to your marriage one day, and you get to all of those other things, when things don't go your way, you're going to bail out, or you're going to fail at that too. But if you learn how to light the fire of success, light the fire of life, somebody shout hallelujah, come on. Hallelujah. It's amazing, the Bible says, how big that fire will become. You'll have the, the fire, listen, how about the fire of smiles? How about the fire of joy? How about the fire of prosperity, huh? How about the fire of success? How about the fire of yes you can? How about the fire of greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? How about you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Come on, how about letting the weak light the fire and say, I am strong? Now that, that's what the Word's saying. Verse 6, the tongue is a little fire. It's a world of iniquity. Woo! Don't even get me started on that. You want to release the iniquities of three to four generations? You want to release them in your life? Just start saying them. If you've got an iniquitous strain that's come through your family, and they were alcoholics and drug addicts and sexual uh, perversions of some kind, they were whoremongers and fornicators or... Uh, adulterers or child molesters or whatever in the world happens with all that in that world. If you got that in your past and people got it in their past, people involved in porn all the time, you want to light that fire? Just start talking about it. And watch what you hear and what you say. And watch that get lit again. You want to release that world of iniquity? Oh, I'm preaching so good. Don't y'all wish I'd have done this Sunday morning when those people really needed it instead of us? I'm... How about gambling? How about just gambling? I'm not talking about some little fun, you know, domino game and all that. I'm talking about somebody who's risking, you know, the, the kids, uh, you know, food and tennis shoes and all of that. They're just addicted to this thing and they can't get away from it. How about drugs? How about foul words? Man, we come from a line of cussers. I'm telling you, our family, they could cuss a blue streak. You never had to worry what was on their mind because they'd open up and let her fly. They'd give you a piece of their mind so quick, that's why they ain't got much of their mind left today. <laughs> that's an iniquity. I said, that's an iniquity. How about serving false gods? Look me right in the face. Everybody serves some form of deity in their life. Now there's only one that's real. That's our Father God, His Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit today. Can I have a big hallelujah? But everybody worships at the altar of something. So it's extremely important that you and I do not light the fires of iniquity are the worlds, the world of iniquity in our own lives with our tongues. So is the tongue among our being, our members. 
that it defileth the entire body, and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Woohoo! Oh my goodness. How many of you are glad that God will, and this was from Sunday morning, He will forgive your sin and He will deliver you from those iniquities? Amen. Glory to God. I think that's a great place right there to magnify the Lord. Come on. I, come on. Three seconds. Somebody just give God the praise that He will set us free. Oh, hallelujah. But it begins with understanding exactly what we're saying. That's why he wrote about it. And secondly, it, you have to embrace it and then begin to say it with your mouth. What does God say? Recognize what it is and then say what God says about it. It's amazing how the weak in every area, well, I'm weak toward, you know, I'm weak toward meth, or I'm weak toward beer, or I'm weak toward immorality and sexuality. No, no, no. Let the weak say, I'm strong against that. I'm strong. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. How many of you know God didn't make your body just to put cheese nachos in it? Huh? Come on. My body is a bag for Tostitos. No, your body is a bag for the Holy Ghost. It's a wine vessel, the Bible says, that's become a new wine vessel, and God's put new wine in you. You're a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. And I don't have anything wrong with, you know, nacho cheese and all that, but <laughs> just remember you have a higher call. Amen. Yeah. Put chili on it. For every kind of beast, verse 5. <laughs> For every kind of beast and birds and serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I think I'm going to stop at this verse and just share with you just for a moment right here. The Bible says, so is the tongue, and I want you to leave that verse up on the screen. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Woo! Like I don't need God in my life. I say what I want to and I'm going to do my own thing. Well, that's exactly what uh, the, uh, the Apostle James is writing and God saying to him this evening. Because you can talk yourself into hell. And the only way to get out of hell is to change and talk your way out by faith. Can I have a big amen? amen? It begins right there. Yeah. Now listen, someone else, if you listen to them, may talk you into hell, but they'll never talk you out. That's right. That's right. They might even change what they say and, and get themselves right later on. But it's important, uh, of course, that they then go and try to make right what they have done wrong through their words to everybody else. Make sure if they have the opportunity to correct that. But no one can talk you out of hell but you. Hallelujah. I'm talking about in this life. Hallelujah. Listen, the Bible says that the tongue can no man tame. I'm going to give you a couple of words and then we're done for tonight. Y'all, are y'all learning tonight? Yeah. The Greek word here is the word D A M A D Z O, uh, demazo. It means to uh, it means to demonstrate. Or excuse me, it means to domesticate, it means to tame, to subdue, uh, to bring under control, to take a, uh, a wild animal. Actually, the, the people that used to train uh, in that day, in the, in the Bible day, that was actually a word that was given to them like domesticators. They were the people that would train a, a, a wild animal. The Bible says that the tongue is something that no man can tame. Your tongue is very spiritual and it is very powerful because it is tied to talking ability that is tied to your brain or to your spirit, one of the two. The Bible says that in Proverbs a wise man lets his heart, lets his spirit teach his tongue what to, uh, what to say, how to talk, what to say. Too many times we just let our brain teach us what to say. Like we see sick people and we say, oh my God, if I get close to them, I'm going to get sick. That's your brain talking. But hallelujah, the Bible says that you and I today will lay hands on the sick in the name of Jesus and they shall recover. That's your spirit talking. 
because you've learned that from the Word of God. And the Bible says a wise man lets his spirit teach him because the power of life or of death is in your tongue. And without the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, and your personal discipline with the Kingdom of God, your cooperation with the Kingdom of God, you will not tame and bring into control that undomesticated spiritual ability that is in your tongue that most people know nothing about whatsoever. They think it's all psychological. They think it's just verbal communication. Not realizing that God talks and He taught man and only man to talk like God. And Adam lost that ability to speak to the earth and now that entire process uh, went to a works thing or laboring to bring it out of the earth today. But oh when Jesus comes somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Things begin to change in your life and one day the Bible says He will set up a new heaven and a new earth where it dwelleth righteousness and everybody will be speaking. I don't know if you'll be able to, to speak into existence chocolate cake or not, but I sure hope so. I know that. <laughs> right now I have to pull up to McDonald's and order something. One day maybe I can just do that at the house. I almost do it now. I told Cindy, honey, we don't even need a kitchen in this house any longer. We just need a drive-in window right there where the kitchen used to be, it seems like. Those are the kind of things you never say to your wife. <laughs> to domesticate. The Bible says the tongue can no man tame. Do you remember in Mark chapter 5, and I'll say this quickly, in Mark chapter 5 when the demoniac uh, was bound with chains. He's cutting himself and he would break the chains, the Bible says. And it says, and no man could tame him. That's the other place that, that Scripture is used in the Bible. That word's used in the Bible. It just means they could not control and subdue him. Which makes me think they might even have brought a, 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 a lot of, um, because of the viciousness of this guy, it's possible that they might have uh, even brought animal a tamer like lion tamers or people like that to try to cut because he was such a wild man. But they, they said, man, we can't do it. We can't tame him. The scripture says, and then of course Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. One day, he, one evening he was in a graveyard down there hanging around the tombs and cutting himself. That's called trying to commit suicide. He's down there trying to kill himself. And Jesus just sails right into his worst nightmare. How many of you are glad Jesus doesn't care? Come on. Right. He'll go anywhere. It doesn't bother him. He can walk on the water or he can walk on top of the graves or he can pull them out of the graves, whatever it takes. He just comes right up into that graveyard where the demoniac was. And the demoniac in a moment of sanity ran to Jesus and fell at his feet and started saying the right words. He started worshiping the Lord. Yes. And then that demon started speaking out of him. And started changing what he trying to change what he was saying, but too late. He had already started magnifying the Lord of life and the Lord of healing and the Lord of victory. And, and 6,000 demons that were in that man could not stop him in his weakened mental, physical condition from magnifying the Lord and getting set free, clothed in his right mind, and becoming an evangelist, the Bible says. Woo! Hallelujah. It says that, that the tongue, it's an unruly evil. There's an interesting word. Unruly is the word akatastatos, A-K-A-T-A-S-T-A-T-O-S, akatastatos. And it means something that is restless, unruly evil, nervous, jittery. It's like, and he's speaking here about a serpent. And he's saying it's like a poisonous, there's two kinds of serpents that are mentioned in the Bible. One is called a constrictor, and the other is called a viper. Constrictors are real slow and methodic, and they just kind of slowly wait till you go to sleep, or you're unaware, and then pop, you know, they try to get a hold, and then they start slowly wrapping around and wrapping around, and the more they wrap around you, and every time you exhale, then they crush down again, and they crush down until finally you become lunch. And that's how uh, the constrictors are. They're not necessarily poisonous in their bite. And then there's the viper. 
the Scripture talks about. Like the one that got a hold of Paul's hand when he was shipwrecked on Malta. And, and so when, when things like that happen, when a viper strikes, he's got these, these two fangs. I watched the thing on it the other night on TV again. It was just fascinating to me. Uh, they have these two fangs that, that, that are connected to the top of their head. And when, when they open their mouth, it causes those fangs to hinge out in a curve. And they're hollow like a straw, like a, like a hypodermic, like a needle. They're hollow. And when they hit, they fasten down. And when they fasten down, the top of their head and the back of their head is where uh, the syringe is. And when they hit and push down, it squirts that venom through those two hollow fangs into the bloodstream of their victim. I saw that on TV. I watch National Geographic. It's amazing. And that's exactly what he's saying right here. Watch. He says, the tongue is restless, it is unruly, a catastasis. It is, it is like a poisonous serpent who is nervous and jittery. They're always real jittery. They're not like a constrictor. They're like always scared and moving and all of that. And if you mess with one of them, they're going to be rattling. And, and then all of a sudden, pop, you know, they're a whole different thing. He said the tongue's that way. Like you go all day and you're like, all right, I'm just whatever and hallelujah. And then all of a sudden somebody passes you on the interstate and, and for whatever the reason, you know, that wasn't a good pass. <laughs> they cut in front of you too much or they whatever. And, and the next thing you know, out of your mouth. Woo! Make sure you don't do that in Texas because we have a right to carry. Y'all remember that. But still it's real important to not be that kind of person. Amen. Can I get a better amen? amen. Like that, that nervous thing, like suddenly, all of a sudden, that, that rattlesnake's just over there just sound asleep, and, and then you come walking by, and all of a sudden, bam, he's in full, full action. He goes from zero to ten, just like that. And like you, you just got a raise on the job. Oh, hallelujah. We're going to church tonight. Sheik Mosai. Let the devil pass me by. And then the devil passes you. <laughs> Unruly. Full of deadly poison. Now, those are four words, full of deadly poison. It's one Greek word, thanatophoros. The word thanatos, thanatophoros is one big word. Uh, it's two words put together, thanatos and, and uh, pharos. But anyway, uh, thanatos is there's two, two main words for death in the, in the uh, New Testament. Thanatos means death or dying. It means death in the Greek, in the original language. And then pharos put together, pharaoh, pharos, it means to carry about or to bear something about, like to carry something. And man, it was wild. I had the, uh, the, the twins, uh, Josh's uh, little boys there. I had the twins and I thought, man, I've been carrying these little guys around. For, for 11 months now. And I remember the first time I took those two little twins in my arm, and I held them there, and they was like 12 pounds. I'm like, oh my God, there's never been any little boys like this in my family for the last 40 years, you know, in mine and Cindy's family. These are little boys. We had all these sweet little girls. And these are little boys, and they're just kind of looking at you. Know, stuff. So last night I'm over there, night before last, I'm over at the house. And as soon as I walk in, well, they come running. Here they come. You know, they're walking now. They're 11 months old. And here they come. They come toddling across there, and they're like that. And I grabbed up uh, uh, Mackie. I grabbed little Mackie up. I went, oh, man, this little dude's growing, isn't he? And then I reached out, and here's the other one hanging on my legs. I squatted down, and I picked him up, and Grandpa was holding both of them boys. And I'm like, my God, this is over 40 pounds. <laughs> I'm like... This is 45 pounds. <laughs> so I held him there for about three minutes, you know, about like one, one boxing match round, you know, like one round. I've got these two guys. I'm like, I'm walking around with, you know, just a little, you know, a little less than 50 pounds, over 40 pounds. I'm holding, that's a lot of weight. Yeah. And then if they poop in their diapers, 45 pounds. <laughs> And, I, and, I'm, and I'm walking around carrying these two little guys, and man, my forearms started aching a little bit, you know, and all of that. And I'm like, whoo, these boys are heavy. And I looked over at Josh. I said, Josh, these boys are heavy. And Josh went. 
And so Catherine ran over and got them both and went, okay, Daddy, I got them. <laughs> what is that all about, huh? <laughs> so let's talk about that just for a moment. <laughs> Why is it that a mother can pick up 45 pounds of baby and carry it around literally all day? And they can't take out the garbage. <laughs> it don't weigh five pounds, that garbage bag. Like, that garbage bag is heavy. Would you take it out for me, honey? Grandma, Grandma, Grandma Cindy, holding both of them, want me to carry the garbage bag out because it's heavy. I'm like, when we get to heaven, all this is going to get evened down. All right, listen. Thanatos and Pharaoh, who put the two words together, it means to carry about death. It says the tongue is unruly, full of deadly poison. It means it carries about death. And no one can tame it. But it can be tamed. I said it can be tamed. Somebody shout Holy Spirit. It is absolutely mandatory to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. The first thing when God poured the Holy Ghost out on the day of Pentecost, it started in their tongue. Hallelujah. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and started speaking a whole new language under the unction of God. And what used to be poisonous and deadly suddenly became activated with life. They begin to activate the power of life. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because Jesus had resurrected and given what the Bible calls an earnest or a portion of what Adam lost, he gave it back to us. And I can tell you where you activate that in your life when you first with your natural language say yes to Jesus, you have eternal life. And when you get filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, and you begin to speak with other tongues as God gives you the utterance. I'm preaching better than you're amen. And you activate the powers of life. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. The power of life begins to come through you. That's why it's so important not just to be born again and go to heaven, but God wants you to have power and authority and that ability to multiply. And I'm not talking babies, I'm talking life. Yeah. In life and subdue in life. Yeah. And with the, we're praying, Lord, let your kingdom come. Yeah. And then if we're talking death about a kingdom that's full of nothing but life, how are you going to operate in that quandary? God solved the dilemma real quick. He said, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Let the power of life begin to come through you. When you pray, pray in the, in the understanding and pray in the Spirit. Yes. Activate the power of life, Amen. not just the power of death. Because your tongue has them both. Your tongue is tied to your brain. Ephesians 4 says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So get the Word and the Spirit of God flowing in your mind. And then be filled with the Holy Spirit in your heart. That's your spirit man. And begin to pray not only with your English or Spanish language, but with your heavenly language. And activate the power of life that flows through your tongue. We don't want venom to come out of us. We want the antidote. We want life. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.